disconnect. Just, okay. just in case it yeah. no kind of messes things up. I don't know, could you export this as a PDF or something like that? Yeah, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if maybe there is a problem on a website, I don't know. <laughs> no problem, take your time. It's the last. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think I don't have enough time in three minutes to figure out. What yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Just to be sure, your name is Roman. Roman. Hmm? Roman. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just don't want to mispronounce uh, it. No, it's Roman. <laughs> Usually in English, I always say Roman like the Romans, and people yeah. are making fun of me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> 
He's um, in IDM and uh, yep. especially I guess it's uh, mostly in uh, certificate servers. So do you also work on the free IPA? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Awesome. I'm, I work here in Brno. So yeah. yeah. Most of our team is here. So yeah. I saw Fraser Reich. Last year? He was here last year, right? Yeah. Yep. yep. I was. Yeah, good stuff. He's my Haskell mentor. <laughs> yeah, he teaches, well, not teaches really, but he's helping us uh, doing functional programming and something like that. Yeah, he's kind of and, uh, enthusiastic. He's, he's a bit of an advocate of that, and yeah, yeah. I kind of always wanted to learn about I, I, it, so um, I, know. I know he, he has a few bad projects in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, it's fun stuff. Very abstract, though. Yeah, uh, I like uh, the abstract part, but but when it comes to monads, mm. the output input, I hate it. It's yeah. so awful. The, yeah. the function part, the pure function part, is nice and perfect. It's mathem mathematics in yeah. other words, but the monads are awful. I don't like it at all. <laughs> is there a technical aspect you don't like about them, or is this the theory? Uh, I, I think the theory that, yeah. that it's just break the whole nice idea I think <laughs> of it's, pure functions, it's, but it's not usable without it. I, yeah. I, I know it. <laughs> there was this interesting uh, video from Simon Eaton Jones about the uh, the difference between useful and theoretically correct. Yeah, yeah. And where he says, well, you want something with side effects, otherwise we can't do any computations. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I understand. I, I know it's useful. They're needed there, but uh, yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, what I stumble over most often when learning Haskell is, like, what I like about it is, like, it's challenging. Like, it's yeah. sort of, when you, like, I was working with Python and basically procedural and, you know, object on the program languages for, for years, I'm still doing it. And so, Haskell sort of challenges, well, any function functional program language, I guess, what challenges this. And you can, you know, think about something in new ways, but, like, the amount of theme, like, I was at the last Lambda Jam in Brisbane, and Edward Wett Matt was there, and uh, he was talking about co-monads and sort of, you know, walking up and down like a tiger and, you know, doing all this theory and I was like just sitting there. This is my first conference where I have no clue about what people are talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, I think that's also what lots of people feel like. When I was starting, it was like, uh, half an hour thinking and three lines of code and it magically worked. Ah. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of a, a cool thing I have to say. <laughs> yeah. And also that everything is so really compact, so you yeah. don't find functions which are sort of like yeah, lots of Almost lines. impossible to write yeah, it. So. Yeah, yeah. It's not like that. Maybe let's start. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Okay, so I will start with some general announcement and... Yep, then cool, pass. yep, yep. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second day of uh, DEF CONF. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's presentations. Uh, just a few reminders. Uh, today, in the D building, there is a whiteboard. You can vote for lightning talks for today's evening. Uh, another important thing, uh, after uh, lunch, some, some time after lunch, uh, it's not specified, uh, at the Red Hat booth, there will be spare tickets for party this evening. I believe it was 3 p.m. 3 p.m., is it set? Okay, perfect. Thank you for inf information. And it's probably all, so... Uh, our first presentation today is about user experience and development for user the first. And please welcome Roman. Thanks for joining my talk this early morning. I kind of felt like nine o'clock in the morning. Probably everyone had a tough night, and so thanks for joining this. Um, I was thinking, I structured the talk around uh, my own experiences. Um, 
especially I first want to define what my problem is uh, in terms of application development, in especially focusing on the user. And then I want to introduce personas, what they are, and how we create them, how they how the theory around creating them is defined and what our experience so far is using them and creating them. Maybe just quickly about me. Um, I'm working for Red Hat in Brisbane. Uh, I'm a software engineer and sort of part-time product manager for, for Beaker. And for the guys of you who never heard about Beaker, Beaker is being used at Red Hat for hardware uh, integration testing. And Beagle itself can manage a whole lab of test computers. I also have a, a few confessions to make. I'm not an, a, a user or usability engineer. I'm not an interaction, interaction architect. I'm just a software engineer. Um, and this persona design process is something I found out about and I was when I found out about it, I thought it's a really interesting concept. And basically, this talk is about our first experiences applying and using it. And yeah, that's where I want to already come to, to the problems I've encountered in my past experiences for application development in terms of centering around the user. Um, I can only speculate, but I think... Um, we sort of, in open source, we start off with a problem and uh, we start off with, with a solution which sort of targets exactly this problem. And from there, we sort of uh, grow and we create a project and there are more people contributing to the project. And so we, we see more contributors, more people involved. And so the more it grows, the more, the harder it gets communicating between each other, especially communicating sort of a prime vision of what the software should do and what the actual user is. Um, the bigger it is, the more it is obviously also prone for people who might just use the software for not its intended purpose and they might define its vision as well. So like this growing software thing has its problems on its own. The other thing is if we look at user-centered design, I've, I think I've never met a software engineer who said, I willfully make this UI really shit so people can't use it. I think all people I've met so far, they are really interested in make UIs really usable. But then you, when, when you look in the usability space, you find things like, you know, never forget the user, you know, don't make him feel stupid. But the thing is, you know, what does it actually mean? You know, how can you actually achieve that? Um, and in my past experience, we we tried to alleviate that. We we tried certain certain solutions uh, to employ in order to focus more on the user. And I want to present uh, three of them, which we've used so far and. All of them, I felt, were kind of helping, but not really targeted. So the first thing was something I stumbled over um, from Joe Spolsky. Um, and he was mentioning hallway usability testing. And I thought, that's, that's an awesome idea. You just grab someone off the hallway, put them in front of your uh, software, of your application, and give them a scenario, a set of tasks, and you observe how they sort of stumble through your application. And derived from these problems he has, you, you tweak the UI. Uh, but as it turns out, depending on what software you're actually implementing, if you have intermediate, or if you target intermediate users or expert users, the guy you're picking off the hallway might not represent the expert on the intermediate user. And so what, what his state is reflecting is probably not reflecting what your actual intermediate users having problems with with your UI. Um, and the other thing is you usually test 
on an already fairly complete uh, uh, artifact. And that is almost too late in the design process. Uh, you want to have something, or you want to have the feedback much earlier. Okay, so usably testing is might, might not be the, the nice, the right thing, so let's, let's ask the users, right? Because they should know, they have the problems. And we do that too. Um, and the problems we stumble about here is that for Beaker especially, the users are usually software engineers. And as we all you know, use software, we, we use Google and we use GitHub and they seem to be you know, employing nice usability and, and nice user experience. They seem to get it right. So if we ask users, they usually come up with solutions. And asking more and more sometimes is a really frustrating process for, for the user and for, for us. Um, and that can sometimes take ages. So for me as a product, product owner who joined the Beaker project just a few months ago, uh, asking all users about their problems could be a really frustrating thing and could probably take years. So that's, that's not a real uh, application here as well. And I think the worst thing which comes out of that is that you sometimes end up with contradicting bug reports. So I've, I've got an example here. Bugzilla just, or well, the Red Hat Bugzilla, sorry, just uh, changed the component list. And in Bugzilla, if you follow a bug report for a product, you have to uh, choose a component. That could be documentation, testing, um, the scheduler part of the product, whatever. And for like the typical products, that component list is perhaps five, ten items long, so not, not really big. But Fedora also uses Bugzilla, or the Red Hat Bugzilla, to, to track their bugs, and that component list is hundred items long. And so when the engineers tried to change this component list to be more performant and more usable from a simple select box to well, something more JavaScripty, something more nifty. Uh, that bug tracks tons of users who say, "Ah, oh, remove it. That's awful." Uh, other people say, "Advocate, hey, let's let's move even further into the jQuery or JavaScript approach because it helps us so much." And that is because some people need to pick a component they already know exists there, and some people actually need to browse for components. So there are, there are this, this opposing um, goals people have when, when they are filing a bug. And just asking users here isn't the solution. And the last thing I've, um, I've encountered, and actually also applied in, in various projects before, is borrowing good UI elements. As I said, we all you know, like using Google and and whatever nice UI we're stumbling up on. And we find these nifty widgets which help getting our stuff done. So we think, hey, let's borrow that, uh, put it in our, U in our UI, and we should have no problem helping our users. Um, the problem is consistency. Um, so I have an example here, which is a GitHub issue. And as you can see, you can comment, and on the issue, you can comment and close the issue. For GitLab, which is sort of the open source panel to GitHub, they've implemented a similar thing, but if you comment and click on close, it discards the comment and closes the issue. And people are sort of um, leaving it dumbfounded, where's my comment? Uh, I think they fixed it now, but if you are not paying attention to the detail, you basically end up with an inconsistent UI. And I think what all these problems have sort of in common is that we sometimes, I think as software engineers, we mistake making things pretty with making things functional. Um, Don Norman, in his book Emotional Design, he 
he made studies on cognitive emotional processing of humans and he found three types of how we process information. Um, there's visceral behavior and reflection. And then um, Alan Cooper in his book about personas, he mapped these three types to different types of goals we usually have in our life and how we, how we use UIs. And the first one, the visceral, that is all about making things pretty. And that, that corresponds to experience goals. So what, how the user wants to feel about using a typical UI. Um, then there are the typical uh, end goals which map to behavior and what the user wants to, what the user wants to do. And I think that is functional. That is something we developers can actually uh, nail without making things pretty. And the third part, which is sort of less common or less important, but also should be mentioned, is the reflection part, which corresponds to life goals. So something who the user wants to be. And I guess all of us have uh, seeing really good products and really good products sort of um, address all three types of things. So if you, if you, I almost hate saying that, but if you use an Apple iPod or something, you know, it looks really nifty, it can be used really nice and they always sort of convey this, this nice life, life thing that, you know, you're, you're hip if you're using it. So they address basically those three, three things. And so having, having said all that about the problems with, the, with we've, what we've encountered so far, I basically want a tool which, which improves communication. Our team is not only in Brisbane, our team is in China, in, in the US, so around the globe. And if we want to have a common focus on the user, we need something which improves communication. And the other thing is, when we talk about user goals, um, I also want something which cannot only be applied to graphical user interfaces. So user interfaces can come in many different types and forms, and um, we have terminal applications, console applications, and striving to address user goals should be the same thing as graphical user applications. And that's where personas basically come in. Um, so what are personas? The first time I've read about personas is in Alan Cooper's book, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And the book is sort of um, split up in two parts. The first part is a, is a huge rant about how shitty we software engineers get the UI wrong. Uh, but if you get through that, uh, the next part is where he explains how he uses and utilizes personas in, in his design process. And it's a really enlightening story. The, the tricky thing, though, is um, it's really high level, and he doesn't convey any kind of process. So, but from then on, I heard about personas, and I thought, I want to use them. And that brings us, basically, to how to create personas. Um, if you look around on the internet, uh, you find all kinds of personas, and the tricky part is that most of them are employed f uh, by web designers for web pages. Uh, Pico is an application. It is a web application, but it is still an application. And when I try to copy what is being found on the internet, it's really tricky because they use and employ a lot of fictional detail, which, because you're, design, you're creating a design tool, which doesn't really help in the design tool if you just copy and paste this stuff. Well, rather not copy and paste it, but try to come up with your own fictional details. So be, be careful about that. Cooper itself uh, created another book, and it's called About Face. And in About Face, he uh, provides about eight steps on how you get from the raw data, uh, the information you have into, and uh, put that into knowledge, into personas. And the next slides, I've split it up a little bit 
into first the theory, and then I talk about our experiences on how we created personas and what problems we've encountered. So the first thing we, we did was preparing. And you want to prepare, like ideally you want to uh, look at how you can segmentate your market. And that can be, like for Red Hat it's sort of easy because you can just pick user roles and different people uh, working in different departments. If you're, not, if you're working outside, then perhaps market segmentation would be a, a first step to go on how to split up your users. Then uh, interviews, you do inter user interviews and record the sessions. Um, and especially important is that you use open-ended questions. Let them talk about a scenario um, and let them talk freely, don't intervene. And the third step is um, that you identify behavioral variables, what they are, I'll just explain in a moment and you create a map and map them. So for the first step, what we did, um, as I already said, we just picked user roles inside Red Hat because that's something we're aware of and it's really an easy way to go to. Um, one hint, uh, try to find as many people as possible who want to do an interview. I mean, ideally what you want to do if you have people on site go to them and observe them in their real environment. I almost said in their wild. <laughs> but, yeah, basically, uh, because the thing is, you also want to see if they are getting interrupted, um, do they have any problems. Uh, that is obviously something if you just do an interview for an hour, you won't be able to see. You can ask for it, but that's a tricky thing. But for us, it's, it's the best tool we have. Uh, what we then did, we used a tool called BlueJeans. Um, it's similar to Hangouts, and the cool thing is that you can record the session, and that's very important because you might have arranged a set of users to interview, and you don't have the time to write everything down because you want to focus on the guy. Uh, you don't have any plan in terms of how exactly the interview will pan out because you want to be flexible and pay attention to what your user is doing and also target the questions to what your user is doing. Because all you want to figure out is what is his motivation, what is his end goal in terms of what's he trying to achieve there. Uh, what we then did, we sent out invitations personally and to mailing lists, um, state what the procedure is and I've also stated or made clear that the session is recorded. Be aware that if you say that the session will be recorded, you should also mention that it's just kept privately because that puts a lot of people off if they know they are being recorded. Um, uh, the interview itself, as I already mentioned, um, avoid any fixed set of questions. And that is something, like the next point is, is something we've stumbled up on really often. Uh, don't discuss technology. For us software engineers, it's really, really hard to stay out of it. Especially if you have or observe users um, and they have problems, you know, you, you feel like you want to help them and, and you, want to, you want to try, you know, why, why is that, why are you having problems here? So the best thing is ask for scenarios and let them explain on what, they, what their typical pain points are and what they usually do. On the next slide I have like three typical questions who, who target exactly the motivation and, and goal level. Um, uh, and especially the last one, the shortcuts, is something users employ heavily for Beaker. They use little scripts which makes their life easier and and that's something we want to target and, and figure out why they're doing that. So after the interviews, um, for us it was really interesting to figure out why people employ certain workarounds. Um, and what we also gave out is a small reward. So 
if, they, if people already spent your time with you, then it's good to give something back. Finding behavioral variables was a really tricky thing for us. So Cooper defines behavioral variables as activities, attitudes, aptitudes, skills, and motivations. The first thing you will find is activities because they map to frequency. How often do people think? And um, what we started off was is using Post-its. Um, it's sort of really handy. You can rearrange them. You don't have anything digital. And it helped us to discuss and brainstorm about what possible things there are people are doing. Uh, use your recordings, obviously. You want to derive that from your recording. Uh, the next step, what I've done was we digitalized it using Inkscape. Um, the vector program is really easy to do quick changes and use fonts and whatever. Um, there are also pitfalls with, with the mapping because the first thing we did and the first go-to item or variable uh, we went with is activities. And like we had tons of activities. People are running jobs, you know, finding things, how often they do that, etc. cetera. Um, we also used user roles instead of your, our users, but you do want to use and map your users because user roles don't tell you anything. Um, some users um, do certain activities more often than others, and you want to find clusters in the next step I'm just coming about too. So don't use user roles or any of your market segmentation. Map your users. Uh, the other thing is we ended up with lots of activities here uh, and mapped them on the frequency. That is also not telling much about motivations. Uh, and what people are trying to achieve. So we had to go back. And basically and now we ended up with, still with activities obviously, but with more um, skills and, and aptitudes. Um, so as an example, we ended up with requires access to bare metal as an attitude and drives process automation as an, uh, as an aptitude. We still miss on skills, and that is partially because we started off with an incomplete set of questions. So next, next steps are theory again, defined by Cooper. And, and once you have that map, you want to you find clusterings. Clusterings on, on behavior. Um, so if, if you have that map, you basically, if you find certain logical clusterings, then that is most likely a goal people are trying to achieve. Um, and as an example, so people who buy CDs are most likely also trying to download, download MP3s. So that is a typical clustering which is log logically consistent. Um, once you have the clustering on the map, uh, you can infer the goals, and that's where you start creating your personas. Um, each persona maps around one or two goals, and you, you start off with, depending on how many users you interviewed, ending up with four, five, six uh, personas. Um, and use bullet points to... to to map out the, the, the goals you infer. So once you have like a set of personas, you want to figure out which is the, the primary persona, which is the guy, the hypothetical user you want to design for. And you nominate one primary persona. If you feel like you have more than one primary persona, you either made a mistake, or it could mean that you really have more than one primary persona, and that usually means you want to design uh, an interface for each primary persona. And from then on, it's basically a, a final step. What you can now do is you have the set of bullet points for your personas. Um, give them a name. Give them a photo. Um, they should feel like real people, even though they are not. They are just composite uh, user types. Um, 
And you can also write out of your bullet points, transform it into a scenario and a story. Be aware, though, that don't put any fictional detail in which is not really helpful for, for your application and your persona. Um, so in, in our first personas, we ended up with education and hobbies and stuff like that. But, you know, how does it tell that Martin, the QE specialist, likes a cooking exotic meals in terms of running jobs in Beagles? So that was something absolutely uh, out of this world. So for us, in our experience, when we looked for patterns, uh, with the set of users we, we've, we had or interviewed so far, uh, it was sort of clear. Um, I'm, I'm worried that, I'm, that we are not sort of following a bias here, but we just run with it and, and inspect and adapt and see how we go. Um, When we inferred the goals from the map, we started off with a simple set of motivations and mapped them out into bullet points that allowed us to discuss it um, with other team members still and, and not sort of set anything in stone. Um, so what I have here is the first persona. Don't worry if you can't read anything what we've written down here. But the first, the first personas we've identified, they still have a lot of fictional detail, as I said, like I had hobbies and personality and stuff like that. I did have goals and I had key differentiators, but what put me off here was that none of this was um, created based on user research or, or any type of process. This was created based on the interviews and as you can see in, in the next example, um, the persona we've actually ended up now with is in different in many ways due to the fact that the scenario depicts his current pain points, whereas I started off with writing a scenario of how it should look or how the, how the, int how the user interface should behave. And you want to... Well, start off with the persona with its current state of, um, of using your software. Uh, yeah. Due to the fact that I've now changed... Um, so I haven't, I haven't added a... Um, I haven't added a photo yet, but basically uh, the, the new persona we've derived from our interviews is basically a QE engineer, and he's only has, he only has one goal, and that is prevent regressions in the software under test. There's another one we found he's trying to find regressions in the software. Uh, we have frustrations and pain points, um, and as you can see, they're all, currently they're all bullet points. Um, it is something uh, really nice for engineers who are sort of a bit um, flaky on writing narrative and scenarios. For them, it's much easier to write bullet points and just flash it out quickly. And in terms of a communication tool, if you want to talk about it, just reading a few bullet points is much easier than writing a whole scenario. Um, when it comes to use to using personas, um, as I mentioned, it the primary form of a persona is a communication tool. Cooper defines using personas by writing scenarios, and he defines it as writing very broad scenarios, and then define more and more detail or add more and more detail into the scenarios for the software you're designing. Um, whoever was at the Pattern Fly um, talk yesterday, they employ personas in their design process uh, in the beginning. I don't know how they use it, if they just use it as a reference and, and see if they are not violating any end goals um, when they are designing new, new interfaces. But um, Cooper is a bit vague in terms of how you... Um, 
how you validate that you are finding the right sweet spot uh, when you employ the personas. I think that's something we just have to find out. For Beaker itself, um, Beaker uses um, a design process which is centered around design proposals and we use some kind of PEP proposal. Uh, people who use Python, they might know that PEP uses, uh, Python uses the PEPs to, to um, set out motivation and why you want to change something. And, um, and the good thing is that it puts people into the state of mind of what can happen, what you want to change. So for us, we want to incorporate the personas and drive the design documents based off the personas. We haven't done that yet. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you there any experience due to the fact that we haven't had the time to employ them yet. Uh, obviously, that is a really elaborate process in how you get to personas. Um, so why, you should, why should you actually create them? Personas in itself from the user interface sort of reminded me um, about uh, creating automated testing. And as you can imagine, if you've never written any tests, it's uh, really hard to start ramping up on automation, automated tests and writing integration tests. So if you don't have any personas, start creating them is an elaborate task. But once you have them in place, it can help a lot in terms of clarifying and communicating around the users and avoiding making mistakes which violates the typical tasks people perform with your software. Um, due to the fact that creating personas can be stretched and can be sort of a side thing you do while you're developing your application if there's no time, you still end up with a hy hypothetical aspect of what your user should be. Um, so there's the benefit of having a focused communication around your users. There are also closing questions. Well, it's still something new to us. We still need to find out how it works for us, how we can sort of scrap maybe aspects of the process which is not so important for, for Beaker itself. Uh, and for development, so we're still learning. If you have experience with that, please come to me. I'd be really interested in talking to you. Any references? I can highly recommend the About Facebook from Alan Cooper if you want to dive into it. Um, there's also a Smashing Magazine article, um, a closer look at Personas, where he follows the Cooper, uh, Cooper idea of creating them, I can recommend that. Um, as I said, be wary of any other um, websites who put fictional detail in the design tool, which can be really confusing and not helpful at all. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Rob. So thank you, Roman. That was very insightful and helpful. Um, question regarding like just usability in general. So some insight. So a lot of development teams have significant backlogs and a lot of that backlog is made up of bugs or significant feature requests. And oftentimes usability enhancements or changes take the back burner, meaning they never make it in yep. because of all the other priority items in the backlog. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations on how you guys would generally address that? Other so basically how we can prioritize on a set of usability issues, right. what, what are the most important ones. I think um, knowing the end goals of what the user wants to achieve with your software should help you uh, prioritize the list of usability uh, things. So it might be that something is in the bug list of making things pretty, but it might not really address the end goal of the user. So. If that's the case, maybe prioritizing more on the functionality part would help the user more than having it pretty. So I would, I would go for that. Thank you. June? <laughs>
maybe one question uh, you ask, uh, how do you feel this question, how do you feel this project? Maybe the users can't give you or exactly mm. answers. So, so June was asking about don't set off, when you do the interviews, don't set off with a fixed set of questions. And I agree. I, I didn't mean just walk in with a blank slate and just see how it goes. Um, you obviously want to have sort of broad uh, questions which address a broad, broad area, and then you, you drill down. But this, how you find out and observe, that should be up to you, and you should be able to drive that on your own. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? How is it generally applicable to bigger open source projects? You know, people are using it, find I need anything else, I just create it and create a pull request on GitHub, and yeah, it worked for me, it's a yep. moment of functionality for me, but you know, I'm a different person than the rest yes. of the user, I can break their use cases for my own. Yeah, that's that's a typical thing with uh, how you how you create design like process improvements. I see that as a process improvement, and that can be a really hard thing to employ because you need everyone on board and use it. But I feel that reminded me on automated testing because in the first years, people were like, "Why do I need the test? It just works. You can see it." You know, so having getting people on board is a really hard thing, and. Um, if you have any other questions, please talk to me. I'd be interested in yeah. yeah, we have one more. So, um, maybe continuing with the resolving of, of maybe conflicting goals of personas, some, sometimes you don't designate one as the primary. Yes, you want to design um, only for this one. I would, I would guess the primary is, should also be the largest number of users of the software in general. doesn't have to be. Um, people make the mistake that they say, oh, you know, we should pick the biggest market segment because that's the um, the use we're targeting for. I can't speak for myself, but Alan Cooper has this prime example that, for example, the flight attendants have this trolley they pull themselves, and they made this trolley especially only for the small market segment of flight attendees. But it, they were so awesome and so became so popular that everyone wanted to have them. So his advice was basically, don't designate the broad market segment. Use one persona, even if it's just 20%, but make him happy and make him, make him love your software. Because anyone else who comes then wants to use that software too. Sorry, we are out of time. More than out of time. Please, if you have any further question, reach to Roman and ask yeah. him. He probably won't run right now. So thank you for Thanks. the presentation. Thanks. And please provide the feedback. Could you please export it as a PDF and upload it to the Flash? You yep. can do it later and bring it to back yes, as, as you like. And uh, if you want, we have a special sticker for oh, our sweet. speakers. So. I can put it on my laptop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you want. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it was really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, really I think, great. Yeah, I Thanks. think it's, it's probably not solvable every time. Because, no, it's a really know, long thing. Usually on